In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I remember when I was school aged, and substitute teachers were always a cause for excitement. Now, I've been a substitute teacher before, so I know on the other hand, it's on the other side, it can be really difficult. But when I was a student and had substitute teachers, not much serious work usually happened. The routine sometimes got a little off track, and we often spent the day playing games. But even though it was fun, it could also be a little unsettling. Every time we asked about upcoming assignments and asked for explanations, the substitute teacher would often say, wait till tomorrow when your regular teacher gets back. Think about what happens when a president is in his or her last few months of office. A lame duck is what we call them, and legislation seems to be either passed quickly or put on hold altogether. And of course, there is what sometimes happens when a church is between clergy. It's easy for congregations to become impatient, feeling like they're in a holding pattern until the next priest comes. A shuffling of responsibilities takes place to make sure that all the crucial things are going to happen. And disappointment can set in when the new clergy person is slower in coming than had been expected. Basically, what we know is that interim periods, the time between leaders, can be difficult and anxiety-ridden times. In today's passage from Deuteronomy, the people seem already to be worrying about what will happen when Moses dies. And God gives reassuring words for Moses to take back to the people of Israel. God says, when you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, I will raise up a prophet like Moses from among your own people. Because this is what you requested of the Lord your God that day at Mount Horeb. Now what God is referring to is a day that had taken place many years before. When God had spoken to the whole assembly of Israelites in a voice that came booming out of fire and cloud and thick darkness. And for good reason, the Israelites were scared. The presence of God had been too much for them. It overwhelmed them. So they told Moses, from now on, you go and hear what God has to say, and then come and pass it on to us, and we will all do what the Lord tells you for us to do. Now, it was a system that seemed to work well for everyone. Moses would talk to God and then let the people know what God had said. It seemed safer than direct communication. The people of Israel preferred the indirect word to the direct word. And so God promises to raise up a new prophet when Moses dies, someone that will take over the role of speaking the words of God to the people of Israel. Now, some background here. The book of Deuteronomy contains very old stories that probably circulated by word of mouth from early on in Israel's history. But all these stories were probably put together into the present form, into the way that we have them now, much later, actually just before or during the Babylonian exile. So when these words were put where they are in the present book of Deuteronomy, it was a time when the people were living in a lot of chaos. And what a comfort this passage must have been to the Jews living in exile. The temple has been destroyed, one way that they connected with God. The monarchy is defunct, another way. And the people no longer live in the land that God had promised to them. Far from being overwhelmed now with the presence of God, like they had experienced at Mount Horeb, 
I suspect that Israel now felt that God was very hidden from her. After all, how can God be with them in this new situation? And the answer is, well, in the word. A word that will spring up from among them. In a time and a place where there is no temple or land or kingship that seems to define them as a community, God's people will be formed by hearing and obeying the word that God sends through the prophets. But the people were still left with the question that causes us angst even today. How do we know when someone really speaks the word of the Lord? How do we know that? Well, the Israelites and we know a prophet speaks the word of God when that word carries with it power, when the thing spoken of actually comes to pass. And that's the kind of power that the people in the synagogue at Capernaum witness in today's gospel reading. Jesus and his disciples come to the town of Capernaum and worship in the synagogue there on the Sabbath. Jesus begins his ministry by teaching, by proclaiming the word, and we're told that the people were amazed with the authority with which he taught them. But while in the synagogue, he finds himself confronted by a man with an unclean spirit. Now, having an unclean spirit doesn't carry any moral judgment in the Gospel of Mark. It doesn't imply that the person with the unclean spirit was bad in any sense, or that they were mired in sin, just that the person is ill and in some kind of need. So with one rebuke from Jesus, the spirit leaves the man, and once again the crowd is amazed, saying, what is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. When Jesus speaks, his word carries power. In particular, for Mark, Jesus' word carries the power to heal. There are 18 miracles in the Gospel of Mark, and 13 of them are healings. Four of those 13 healings actually are exorcisms. So what we have in this passage that we read in the Gospel today is two proclamations of the power of Jesus' words with this exorcism or this healing sandwiched in between. It's as if Mark is making the point that not only does Jesus' word carry with it the power to heal, but we know the authority and the power of that word precisely by its ability to heal. For God's power is never separated from God's love and goodness. It's always healing. We gather in this place week after week for many reasons, I know. But one is that we know that the word of God can heal us. What's interesting about our gospel story today, at least to me, is that this impure man with an unclean spirit is actually found within the walls of the synagogue, not outside. And I suspect that many of us inside these walls are not here because our lives are pristine, are perfect. We're here because our lives are plagued by our own demons and our own needs as well. For some of us, these burdens may be physical in nature. They might be illnesses, addictions, or past trauma. We come with the burden of sin, the shame of past wrongs, the pain of knowing that we let much in this world pass by us without any action on our part. The inability to look past ourselves to even see the need of those around us. Maybe we come with an anxiety that consumes us. Or we come with a hopelessness that springs up from the doubt that anything new is really even possible. But still we come because somehow we know that the word of Jesus is a powerful healing word. Most of us have tried to change our lives ourselves, but we find it impossible to shake the demons that plague us. 
It's clear that our help and our salvation lies outside of us. It lies beyond us. It's clear that our healing requires more than a mere cause and effect, touted by medicine or self-help books. Our healing requires true conversion, newness, transformation. Call it a miracle, if you like. We come here because we know the healing power of Jesus' words, and we know the healing power of the word made known to us in the bread and in the wine. Now, in our tradition, we're all called to participate in the healing power of God's love, not only as recipients of that love and power, but as instruments of it as well. We all know that. In our catechism, we're charged to carry on Christ's work of reconciliation in the world, to do our part in the ministry of healing that we see throughout Jesus' ministry in the Gospels. And just as the people in the synagogue knew the power of Jesus' words through the healing that those words brought, so will the people in this community and the world know the power of God's healing love through what we do and say as the church in the world. Now, most certainly there have been times in history and even today when we in the church don't get it right, when our words and our deeds hurt more than they heal, when our words foster division instead of reconciliation. But what would it really look like for us to speak a healing word to this world? You only have to look on TV to see that words carry the power to hurt and they carry the power to heal. Will those who come in contact with us know whose we are, know to whom we belong by the power of our healing words? Will they know that by the power of our words and deeds? And so our question this week is, what will I do? What will you do? What will we as the church do this week to reflect the power of God's healing love? Okay.